I came home early after a brutal 30-hour shift, just wanting a shower and sleep. Instead, I found my wife, Nancy, in our bed with her boss. Rage consumed me. Grabbing my son's baseball bat, I unleashed hell on that man. The police dragged me away, but I felt nothing. Prison was my new reality, and I planned my revenge there. Nancy's betrayal shattered me, and I refused to see her or my son. I had to rebuild my life alone, fueled by anger and the need for justice. This is my story of betrayal, rage, and a cruel plan for revenge. The whistle blew as I got up from my spot by the chain-link fence. It marked the end of my time outside with 20 other men. I stayed away from trouble. Freedom was too close to mess it up now. I walked toward the field's edge, lining up with the other inmates to go back inside. My name is Carmine Montoya. I've been here at Ohio State Penitentiary for a long time. There are over 500 of us here thanks to the state of Ohio. I'm serving 7 to 10 years for assault. I took a plea deal because I was guilty and wanted to pay my debt to society. My court-appointed lawyer arranged it, and I didn't complain. We get two hours outside each day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. This was our second hour, and the whistle meant it was over. We walked through the gate into the main hallway. The sounds of the gate closing behind us and our shoes on the floor had become part of my routine. This place had been my home for over five years. We walked down the long hall, cells on both sides, two levels high. Guards watched us closely. No talking was allowed, just marching silently. My group was on the ground floor. As we reached our cell, men split off in pairs to go inside. My current cellmate, Owen, jumped into the top bunk. I took the bottom one since I'd been here longer. A guard checked to ensure we were in our cell and signaled for the doors to close. They locked us in until dinner. So, tomorrow's the day, eh, Doc? Owen spoke up. Yeah, tomorrow's the day, oh, it'll be good to get out. Yeah, good, you got my number, I'm out in a month. I got it. I hope I won't need it until my parole is done. We didn't talk much. Silence was golden in here. After years inside, there wasn't much to discuss. Our cells were bare with just cots and steel toilets. The prison library had old books and the movies were ancient. Not much to keep us entertained. Owen was in for manslaughter. He attacked a man threatening his kids and messing with his wife. He stabbed him but didn't kill him, so he got 15 years. His wife divorced him and he hadn't seen his kid in 10 years. Later, the same man was killed in a robbery. Owen wasn't surprised. He just said, good job, and didn't look back. With his good behavior, the parole board let him out early. I picked up a medical journal from the prison library, but soon put it down. I wanted something else to read. I grabbed a novel by Ludlam. It was deep, dark, and violent. Perfect for passing the time. I had read all his books in the library. I've been here for five years, three months, and ten days. Due to overcrowding, the court said prisoners who serve 70% of their term could get parole. I got mine on the third try. No one came to speak for or against me. I kept it low-key. My old boss, Jason Watley, promised me a job and a place to stay when I got out. That clinched it for the parole board. He had a private practice in Columbus now and wanted me to join him. He had made some calls and my medical license was renewed without trouble since my crime wasn't related to medicine, and I passed the skills test. The parole board liked this, and with a supportive letter from Jason, they decided to grant me parole. While I was in, my only visitor was my sister Eileen. She was married with three kids and had moved into our parents' home in Cleveland after they died in a car crash three years ago. Before that, mom and dad wanted to visit, but I asked them not to. I didn't want them to see me there. Despite my wishes, mom and Eileen visited every couple of months until mom passed away. Dad sent letters but respected my wishes. He found the whole thing too painful. Now that they were both gone, only Eileen kept coming. We never talked about my ex-wife and my child. Eileen knew I didn't want to hear about them. I thought they were better off without me. After all, I had lost control and almost killed Hugo. I didn't think I would have hurt Nancy, but I couldn't be sure, so I decided to leave them behind and move on. It seemed better for everyone. When Eileen visited a week ago, I told her about my deal with Jason. She was happy for me. We promised to stay in touch after I was released. She asked if I had a place to stay or needed anything. I told her Jason had it all handled so she didn't need to worry. Once I settled in, I would call her with my information. 
Laying on my bunk, thinking about all this, I sighed and tried to nap. Time seemed to drag slower now than usual. All I had to do was get through dinner and one more night in this awful place and I would be free. Free from what? Well, that's on public record, so I don't mind telling you. It was because I beat a man almost to death. He barely survived, and I was arrested and charged with assault with intent to kill. My court-appointed lawyer helped me get a plea deal that reduced the charge to simple assault. I was guilty and ready to admit it, so we avoided a trial. I agreed to serve not less than seven and up to ten years in prison. It was all very polite, and off to jail I went, out of reach of those who wanted me severely punished. What happened? It was quite simple. I was a doctor at a local hospital, a bone specialist. I had worked almost 18 hours and was about to go home. I wanted to see a patient in the ward before leaving. Then a serious accident happened, and I was called in to help. I worked in trauma for five more hours and then had to do emergency surgery on a man who could lose his leg if not treated right. I was in surgery for six more hours. By then, I had been on duty for over 30 hours straight. I got a colleague to take my next shift as I was too tired. I left the hospital and called my wife Nancy to let her know I was coming home. She didn't answer, so I left a message saying I'd be home soon. It was a little after one in the afternoon. Since she worked part-time and was off that day, I expected her to be home. When I got home, there was a strange car in the driveway. I thought maybe a friend had stopped by to see Nancy. I walked into the house exhausted after working so long. I found nobody downstairs and figured they must be out shopping or something. All I wanted now was a hot shower and some sleep. I walked into the bedroom and saw a sight that burned into my memory. Even five years later, I can still see it. My wife was on the bed with a man on top of her. The bed made a little rhythmic squeak. I didn't say a word. I just turned around and walked out of the room. After that, things got blurry. When I tried to remember it later, it felt like it happened to someone else, and I was too tired to recall it clearly. All I know is that they said I left the room, grabbed a baseball bat from my son's room, and then went back to the bedroom where my wife Nancy and her boss Hugo Bentz were still in the middle of being unfaithful. I hit Hugo on the back with the bat. When he noticed me, I swung it again, hitting him in the side, breaking some ribs, and jamming one into his lung. It seems I kept hitting him until my wife jumped on me, knocking me down. I got up and tried pushing her away before she ran to our son's room and locked the door. She called 911, and the police arrived shortly after. They found me sitting in the family room, staring off into space, holding the bloody bat. When they asked if I was okay, I couldn't answer. I dropped the bat and stood up. I wasn't aware of anything by then. Whatever rage I felt before was gone. I couldn't respond when they asked me my name or anything else. My brain was fried. I stayed that way for days. Hugo was still upstairs in our bed, unconscious. He was taken to the emergency room. I heard that it was touch and go for a while before they got him stable. I had given him a concussion and broken some bones in his arms, legs, and a couple of ribs. They said later he needed several surgeries, but got better without issues. Nancy wasn't hurt, and she told the police what happened. Since Hugo was there with her permission, they charged me for attacking him as her guest. Can you believe that? My wife invited him over to cheat on me in our house and bed, and I was the one in trouble. My first clear memory after that was sitting in a small room with a very serious man asking me questions. I woke up, looked at him strangely, then started to answer normally. A policeman came in, handcuffed me, and I was charged with felony assault. That all happened several days later. I had been in a hospital, unresponsive for all that time. Now, suddenly, I was awake and I could face punishment for my actions. Nancy tried to visit me while I was in jail waiting for trial, but I refused to see her. She tried to post bail, but I refused that too. I didn't want her to get a lawyer for me. I asked for and got a court-appointed attorney. He told me that the state was worried about their case because Nancy refused to testify against me, so they were willing to make a deal. I told him I wanted to plead guilty, which surprised him. He argued with me, but I wouldn't discuss it further and told him to work it out. He asked why I wanted to do something so crazy. I let him talk until he was tired out, then calmly explained. I knew my wife had cheated on me. I knew I had acted without thinking clearly. With Nancy not testifying against me, I could probably get off. But it mattered to me that I had almost killed a man in anger, and I felt I had to pay for that. And what would I go home to? 
a wife unhappy with our marriage, a son so disappointed in me that he'd come to hate me? He listened, shaking his head, but in the end, it was my decision. When they brought me to court, I pleaded guilty. The judge asked me a bunch of questions as if I was a fool and finally accepted my plea. Sentencing was set, and I told my lawyer to go for a deal. He was a good lawyer with a kind heart, so he followed my wishes. I think he tried to get me the best deal possible, so it wasn't all bad. Once in jail, I refused all of Nancy's attempts to see me. I sent her a short note telling her not to visit me or bring our nine-year-old son. I said I would refuse to see him, too. I explained I never wanted him to see me in jail. That would hurt me more than anything else, seeing my boy view his father behind bars. One reason I pleaded guilty was to avoid this shame for my wife and son. I promised myself this wouldn't affect them. It was my crime, my sin, and I would pay for it. My first year in jail was awful, but I got lucky. They paired me with a man named Bruno Conseco. He was in for murder and serving life. He found out I was a doctor before jail and liked me. He said we could do well if I offered medical advice, with him as my agent. At first, I refused, but after getting beaten up the first time I looked at someone wrong, I agreed. Bruno took it from there. Soon, using my medical knowledge, I made a few friends, gained respect, and was generally left alone. Bruno and I split the consulting fees, which were usually cigarettes, candy, magazines, and the like. We did pretty well, and I became well off. Bruno was later moved to a max security prison somewhere else, but by then I was okay and knew how to get by. After that first year, I was told Nancy was filing for divorce. She wanted to meet, but I sent her a note instead. I refused to see her and wished her well with her new life. I told her to write her own terms and I would sign without any fuss. I just wanted it over with. She could have everything. The house, the cars, the clothes, and the jewelry. We had a good bank account that should last her long enough to get the insurance money if I couldn't work anymore. I didn't want to argue when I knew my marriage was over. My tired mind understood it clearly that day. My son would always be in my thoughts, but it was better this way. No child should see their father in prison. That was wrong in so many ways. That was years ago. I've managed to forget most of it. I spent some time with the prison counselor, and he helped me forgive Nancy for what she did. He said forgiveness was for my own sake, not hers. He was right. I felt a lot better after that. Sometimes weeks would go by without me thinking about my old life, but I still remembered my son and wife. Funny enough, I never stopped loving them, even after what happened. Over time, her cheating faded from my mind, and I remembered the good moments. Being alone made the good times seem even better, and the bad times less bad. I think that was true. Anyway, the day I got out of prison arrived. Believe it or not, saying goodbye to some of the other inmates was hard. There was Owen, Tiny who saved my life a couple of times, Benny Five Fingers, Tony T, Pan, Willie, and others. I worked in the prison hospital for three years, helping many inmates. I saved Benny's life by finding a tumor, and I helped Tiny get a reduced sentence by informing his lawyer about a hormone issue that affected his behavior. Leaving behind these friends who I met during tough times was hard. Our friendships were real and based on respect, unlike many outside. I gathered my few things and was taken to the prison gates. The sound of the gate closing behind me was unique. It was the sound of freedom. I turned and watched the guard lock it. He saluted, and I saluted back. Even the guards felt like friends in a strange way. I blinked in the bright sunlight and saw Jason waiting in a bright red Cadillac. He waved, and I walked towards him, slowly and wary like a freed inmate. He gave me a big hug and pushed me into the car. We left the prison, and I never looked back. Six months have passed, and now I'm practicing at Jason's clinic in Columbus, Ohio. We handle important cases, mainly reconstruction, and the pay is fantastic. I'm making more money than ever before and adjusting to living free again. It was tough at first. Loud noises or yelling made me jump. I always scoped out a building for exits and found it hard to look people in the eye, a habit from prison where guards saw direct eye contact as a threat. The only restriction now is reporting to my parole officer every two weeks. He said this wouldn't last long, and soon he might just make random visits. I had to stay in the area for two more years, but otherwise, I was free. With my first month's pay, I got a small apartment on the edge of downtown. The rent was cheap since it was in a rundown area, but the apartment was spacious with lots of windows and light. It had two big bedrooms and a full kitchen. 
though I only cared about a microwave for frozen dinners. I paid for the first and last month's rent, bought a mattress, some blankets, and a lot of canned and frozen food. Furniture would come later as I earned more. After prison, this place felt like heaven. I moved in and made it home. Over the next few months, I bought more stuff from yard sales and newspaper ads. I no longer needed expensive things. Prison taught me what mattered. After five months, I had a real bed, some drawers, a couch, a TV, and a kitchen table. The second bedroom was empty, but I had no need to fill it. I was content and settled. I let Eileen know where I was and gave her my new phone number. She promised to stay in touch and asked about my plans. I told her I wanted to get used to dealing with normal life again and my job. The rest would come with time. Once settled and bored, I contacted someone Tiny told me about before I left. Tiny was from Mansfield, not far from Columbus. He had many contacts outside. One was a private investigator, and I hired him to find my ex-wife and son. I just wanted to know where they were and their new names. Nothing more. We met, and I gave him their last known address, names, and social security numbers. I didn't know what last name she was using now, so I left that part to him. In less than a week, he got all the information. He gave me everything, shook my hand, and refused my money. You're a friend of Tiny's. Your money isn't needed here. I know what you did for him. Need anything else? Just call. I'll get it done. I thanked him and watched him walk away. Prison wasn't something I would recommend, but the friends I made there were for life. The benefits were big, more than outsiders could imagine. I would lean on some of them later. When I got home, I microwaved a meatloaf and mashed potato dinner. I sat at my small table next to a wall of windows and opened the envelope he gave me. Inside was all the stuff the investigator found. Nancy Montoya, age 35. Son, Ruben Montoya, age 14. Address with local phone number attached. No phone listed for Ruben. Interesting, she hadn't changed her name. Maybe to keep it the same as our son's. I was surprised she hadn't remarried or had someone adopt Reuben. She was a beautiful woman, noticed by many men, and could have had any man she wanted. Maybe she was just living with one now. I took a bite of food, trying to convince myself I didn't care, and read more. Ms. Montoya and son lived together in a small house in a neighborhood in Groveport. No others living in the home. Miss Montoya works at a vet clinic. Reuben goes to school in Groveport and is in the ninth grade. No record of any civil or criminal activity for either of them. No known friends for Miss Montoya. No male friends, but she goes out with several women friends, names available. Reuben has many contacts, but one, Eddie Clemens, also 14, is often at their home. Reuben also stays at Clemens' house sometimes. Bank records show a small savings account, a checking account with normal activity, and one credit card. Current balance is $235.67. Savings account is $154,000 and checking account is $1,233.90. Public records show a sale of property in Brentwood Subdivision of Southern Columbus three years ago. Proceeds were deposited in a local bank, then moved to a separate account and to the current bank account. No record under known SS numbers for the second account. Could find out more if requested. Our house was worth a lot more and didn't have a mortgage. I couldn't remember much about that time, so I just accepted the figures. It didn't matter to me. I gave her everything in the divorce. I wanted to leave that house and its memories forever. Rarely did I see flashes of Hugo with Nancy, and even those visions were fleeting. I didn't feel the pain now. The isolation of the past five years washed it all away. I tried to remember that afternoon out of curiosity, but got nothing but vague images. No emotion. I put the envelope aside and finished my meal. I drank a Diet Pepsi, my favorite drink now, and settled in to watch TV. I was surprised when I saw those wide screens. I liked them so much that I bought one. It was the only luxury I allowed myself, but that was my choice. I wanted to be left alone. No bars, no fights, no crowded places. I avoided places with more than two or three people. It was slow getting used to people again, and I was in no rush. After a busy month, I found that my share of the partnership was enough to buy myself a vehicle. I thought about what to get and decided on a used Ford pickup that I paid cash for. Driving a truck appealed to me, and I was happy with my choice. My old life was gone, and the new me was becoming clear. The new me was different now. It felt like a good change, but time would tell. The next year went by without anything unusual happening. 
I continued to furnish my small apartment and now had a second bedroom with the usual stuff. I also bought things for my pickup, like a new radio and new tires. That was all I purchased. I started visiting some local cafes for lunch or dinner sometimes. I felt like I was becoming part of the community. Life was good and I started to feel safe. Things were predictable, which was good too. Then I got a phone call from my parole officer. I was at home, as usual, watching TV when he called. Carmine, this is Jack, your parole officer. Jack, I know your voice by now. You call every month. What do you want? I'm not due to report in yet. And you know where I spend my time. Is my parole up yet? Calm down, Carmine. You're still on parole for the next two and a half months. Then you're free. The reason I called is someone you know wants to contact you. Want to know who it is? Sure. One of the boys from OSP? You know I can't talk to them. You're just trying to catch me breaking rules, aren't you? Not cool, Jack. No, it's not one of them. It was your boy, Reuben. He found out you got out of prison and has been trying to contact you. He left me a number after I told him I'd talk to you first. You don't have restrictions against talking to family. You have your son, your ex, your sister and her kids, and a few aunts and uncles. My son? Reuben was looking for me. Damn! What do I do now, Jack? I couldn't believe it. I haven't seen Reuben for over five years, nearly six and a half years. He would be a teenager now, all grown up. What could I say to him? He's your son, you fool. You'll know what to say as soon as he starts talking. That's what parents do, right? They talk to their kids. Sometimes they talk too much if you ask the kids. All he wants is to speak with his dad, the dad he hasn't seen or talked to in so long. But why would he want to talk to me? I'm an ex-con, on parole. Why would a kid want a dad like that? It doesn't make sense. I started to sweat. My hands shook. I couldn't catch my breath. I realized I was having a panic attack. How'd he find you, Jack? How'd he know where to look? I only told Jason and my sister that I was getting out. Your parole was in the local paper. Local doc gets parole, or something like that. He saw it, or someone told him. What's the difference? Oh no, I hadn't thought about that. Now everyone knew. I wondered if other kids gave him a hard time. Probably. Kids can be cruel. What do I do? Call him or do you call him? What number did he give you? I didn't even know he had a phone. Seems he got his own prepaid phone. His mom doesn't know about it. He says she's pretty protective. Tough, but fair. Anyway, I'll give you the number he left. The rest is up to you. That's what I told him. If you call him, great. If not, he understands it's your choice. I wrote down the number and then hung up. I stared at the TV. My son Reuben, divorce and jail had kept me from seeing my own son. I chose that, but it didn't feel like I had any other choice. He couldn't see his father in prison. No way. I had caused him and his mom enough pain already. He didn't need to see me as a convict. When I decided to cut ties, it was for two reasons. First, I couldn't forgive what I saw that day. I knew I couldn't forgive Nancy either, so a clean break was best. I didn't want her convincing me she loved me or it was a mistake. Why make her go through that? It was over. So let it be over. Second, a public trial would hurt them both for a long time. There would be news about the trial, people judging us, my son bullied, details of my wife's affair out in the open and everyone knowing I went crazy. The way I did it, without a trial and publicity, was better for my wife. Easier for my son, too. It took my entire prison time to forget, but I did, somewhere during those years. Even now, I could only think about seeing my son again. Nancy wasn't an issue. I loved her and probably always would, but she was part of my past. She would have moved on by now. She started her new life without me and was better off if I stayed out of it. I thought about it for days, but knew I would call him. I also knew my simple, safe life was about to change. My name is Nancy Montoya. My ex-husband Carmine is in prison for hitting a man and almost killing him with a baseball bat. It was my fault it happened, but Carmine paid the price. I tried to help him when he was charged, but he wouldn't let me. He even refused to talk to me while waiting for the trial. I tried to bail him out, but he refused. I got him a good lawyer, but he didn't want him either. He got a court-appointed lawyer instead. Before I knew it, Carmine accepted a plea deal and went to prison. We have a son, Reuben, who was nine when all this happened. The worst part was Carmine refusing to let his son visit him in jail or prison. He wouldn't see either of us, ever. He sent me a short note telling me to keep Reuben away. I divorced him a year later, hoping he would talk to me or reconsider, but he didn't. The note he sent told me how much I had hurt him. I gave up, knowing I couldn't reach him and he would never forgive me. 
I didn't blame him and still don't. I never forgave myself. I remember what happened as if it were yesterday. I still cry myself to sleep sometimes, even now, almost six years later. I get so lonely sometimes and want to go out or be with someone, but I won't. I refuse to be happy while he is in jail. I put him there. If he has to be alone, so will I. It isn't as hard as it sounds because I can't forget what I did to him. That day, that awful day, when Carmine called to say he was stuck at the hospital, I was angry. I didn't show it, of course. It was his fault I was angry. He wouldn't take the job at that fancy clinic. They wanted him as a specialist. Carmine was great at fixing damaged faces. When someone's face needed to be fixed after an accident, they wanted Carmine. Carmine told me about the offer a month ago, and I was excited. He talked about the money and the normal work hours, not like the emergency room where he was on call one week every month. I said we could have a normal life for a change. He knew that was what I wanted, what I dreamed of. I knew how much Carmine loved working in the trauma ward. He enjoyed the emergencies, saving lives, and it made him happy. But I wanted him to think about our family more. I wanted him to take the clinic job offer badly. I loved him so much but knew it wasn't what he wanted. He loved the thrill of emergencies and helping people who were really hurt. The clinic wouldn't give him that excitement, but I wanted him home more. I felt that our family could also make him happy. We talked about the job and its pros and cons. I wanted him to take it, but he didn't agree. He was happy with his choice, and I tried to convince myself it was best if he was happy. I loved him, so what more could I ask for? How naive was I? A week later, we got a phone call early in the morning. Carmine had just finished a long shift and was supposed to take me to the mall for shopping. Reuben needed new clothes for school, and Carmine promised to come with us. When he called to say there was another emergency, I didn't remind him about the shopping. I was frustrated and let it go. This had happened many times recently and I was getting angry. I had warned him when he turned down the clinic job. While sorting laundry, I thought about the job offer again. It would have given us more time, money, and prestige. Carmine was a great specialist and could choose any job he wanted, but he always chose the most exciting and action-packed ones. I accepted that this was who he was, but why couldn't he choose us, his family, over the excitement? This thought bothered me a lot. Normally I wouldn't think this way, but today I wasn't feeling forgiving. I was bored and hadn't seen Carmine for almost 28 hours. He hadn't called again, so he must have decided to work his regular shift and come home later for his days off. I was still upset when the doorbell rang. I started the washing machine and went to answer. At the door was Hugo Bentz, my boss. He looked stressed and was holding some folders. I invited him in and we went to the family room. What's up, Hugo? You look like something's wrong. Hugo handed me the folders and smiled. Can you do me a favor? Can you type these offers for me by tomorrow morning? I'll pay you overtime. I looked through the folders and saw they were routine offers. I wondered why no one else could do this simple task, but quickly agreed and set the folders down. Sure, Hugo. No problem. I'll have them done by morning. We chatted for a bit and I offered him a beer to extend the visit. Hugo agreed, and we started talking. I liked Hugo, and we often joked around at work. Today seemed like any other day, and we had some fun chatting and having another beer. I started to relax, enjoying the company. I began telling Hugo about my frustrations with Carmine and his job. As the story went on, I made us some stronger drinks. The conversation flowed, and Hugo said he wouldn't leave someone like me alone so much. I felt flattered. When he moved closer, I didn't mind. When he put his arm around my shoulder to comfort me, I didn't mind. When I stood up, almost crying from the frustration, I didn't mind when he hugged me tightly. We stood like that for a few minutes. Then I put my arms around his neck and looked up at him. He leaned in and kissed me. I kissed him back. Hugo led me upstairs to my bedroom, saying kind words and rubbing my back. I didn't say anything. My mind was on his words and my heart was beating fast. I knew it was wrong but didn't stop. I was tired, frustrated, and still angry at Carmine. I was alone so much. I felt in control but also overwhelmed by loneliness. All I wanted was some company. Carmine chose his job over me, and I was determined to do something about it. That's all I wanted until it started turning into something else. I didn't stop it. Even now, after seeing the damage it caused, I still don't know why I didn't stop. Hugo unzipped the back of my dress and pulled it off my shoulders. It fell to the floor, leaving me in my underwear. 
I stared at his face, which was close to mine, as my bra slipped off. He kissed me softly, almost like he hadn't kissed me at all, and then unbuckled his pants. He pushed them down to his ankles. His kiss deepened, and I felt him take off my panties. While still kissing me, he gently pushed me to sit on the bed. I turned my head away when he tried to press his body against my lips. I used to hate doing that for Carmine, but I did it often just for him, even though he never asked. Hugo didn't ask either. For a moment, I almost stopped, but sensing my hesitation, he pulled away and laid me down on the bed. I watched him carefully as he got on top of me. His lips found mine, and I stopped resisting. He moved between my legs. I was already ready for what I knew was going to happen. I wanted to say something, anything, but I was too caught up in the moment to do anything but let it continue. Hugo slowly pushed inside me, and I stopped thinking. Now it was all about feeling, and I wanted this to happen. If it was wrong, I would face that later. Only now mattered. It was just me and him. Nothing else existed. Hugo moved in and out, and even though he wasn't as big as Carmine, it still felt good. I pulled my legs up towards my shoulders to let him go as deep as possible. Soon he was moving in a steady rhythm that started to give me pleasure. I felt a growing sensation that might lead to an orgasm if Hugo could keep going. My eyes were shut, and I held on to the bedspread. As he moved in and out, my mind started to work slowly. This was wrong. This was Hugo, my boss, not Carmine. What was I doing? I wanted to stop, to resist, but the feeling grew stronger. I let my desire take over again. Just as I felt my climax approaching, Hugo jerked and stopped moving. I opened my eyes and saw a flash of metal striking Hugo on the back of the head. He yelled and rolled off me, leaving a trail of fluid. I saw Carmine standing by the bed, his face twisted in anger. He had a bat and swung it again, hitting Hugo in the side. Hugo screamed again, and I rolled off the bed away from Carmine. Standing there, scared and unsure, I saw Carmine swing the bat repeatedly. He would kill Hugo if he didn't stop. I decided to jump onto Carmine's back. He staggered and dropped to his knees. I held on tightly, but he shook me off. I fell back and hit my head on the door. Carmine looked at me, but it wasn't the Carmine I knew. Frightened, I ran to Ruben's room and called 911. I locked the door and prayed Hugo would survive. Crouched in the corner, I couldn't hear anything. I finally peeked out and crept to our bedroom. Hugo was on the floor, covered in blood but breathing. Carmine was gone. I put a wet cloth on Hugo's forehead, then quickly dressed and went downstairs. I found Carmine sitting in the family room, head down, the bloody bat in his hands. I whispered his name, but he didn't respond. I waited until emergency services arrived. I let them in and led them to Hugo. They took over and I went back downstairs to wait for the police. When they arrived, they took Carmine and the bat outside. They asked if Hugo was with me by my choice, and I said yes. I didn't realize I was convicting my husband. They asked me who Hugo and Carmine were, wrote it all down, and seemed uninterested that Carmine found me with Hugo. Some officers looked at me with disdain but said nothing. After that, everything got worse. I went to the police station, gave my statement, and asked to see my husband. An officer told me Carmine refused to see me. I insisted, but it was Carmine's choice, not mine. I called our neighbor to take care of our son, but there was nothing else I could do if Carmine wouldn't see me. I had no choice but to go home and try to fix the mess I caused. I got a lawyer, one of the best in Columbus. He listened to my story and said he could get Carmine off on temporary insanity because of how much he worked and how tired he was. He called it impaired response syndrome. I was relieved, sure Carmine would be found not guilty. When the prosecutor asked me to testify against Carmine, I said no. He threatened to subpoena me, but I still refused. The law was on my side. I couldn't be forced to testify against my husband, and I wouldn't do it. During this time, the only things keeping me sane were caring for my son and fighting for my husband's freedom. I was always talking to lawyers, cops, or anyone who needed information. I worked to free our money for his defense, posted his bail when my lawyer got it, and got ready for the trial. My guilt took a back seat to fighting for Carmine. I couldn't let myself feel his pain. I had no time for regrets. I had to get Carmine out and back home to me and Reuben. That was my focus now. I could try to save our marriage later. Then my lawyer told me Carmine refused bail. I asked how that was possible, and he said it was Carmine's right. Few people did it, but it was their choice. All he had to do was not agree to the conditions of release. 
Bail was canceled, and he stayed in jail. Next, when my lawyer saw him, Carmine fired him. He asked for and got a court-appointed lawyer since his money was frozen from the arrest. Lastly, Carmine refused to talk to me, and I wasn't allowed to visit him. He shut me out completely. I went home the day he told the jail to block me. I sat on the bed in the spare room for a long time before the tears came, and once they came, they didn't stop. I cried for two days, unable to do anything. My guilt, which I had kept down for so long, hit me hard. I knew what I had done. I remembered the pain in Carmine's eyes the day they took him away. I knew the loneliness my son and I would feel from now on. And I knew it was all my fault. After two days, I got up and cleaned myself off. I had to pick up my son from Carmine's sister, who had been taking care of him while I fought for Carmine. I had to tell her I failed and face the shame of it. She knew why Carmine was in jail. I had told her. Her reaction surprised me. She didn't yell at me, blame me, or scold me. She just asked how she could help. I asked her to take Reuben, and she did without question. He had been with her since that terrible day. Now it was time for him to come home. I had quit my job, of course. I couldn't work there anymore. Even if Hugo was in the hospital, I couldn't be anywhere near him. He was no longer a part of my life. Maybe it was too late, but it had to be done. I didn't hate him because it takes two to tango. I blamed him as much as I blamed myself. We both knew what we were doing. I risked my marriage and home. He risked nothing. What happened was a freak accident of timing. Why I let it happen, I still didn't know. Regret wouldn't change it. I felt nothing for Hugo, and I loved my husband. I always would. That never changed and never would. I had messed up, but I still loved Carmine with all my heart. He would be glad to know the pain I was going through, knowing that I lost him by my own actions. He would be so happy. Reuben came home and I started living my life without my husband. I still hoped he would get out soon, even if he wouldn't let me help him. Reuben knew his father was in jail and why, but not what provoked the attack. I would tell him soon, but not now. He was too young to understand and bear that weight. I got him back in school and tried to make life normal for him. It was hard, but I stayed positive. Time was all I had now. Time to think about what I did, what Carmine was going through, and time until Carmine was home again. A week later, I went to the jail to see if Carmine needed anything. He still wouldn't see me or talk to me, but the guards would pass on messages. I asked them to ask him if he needed anything from home. That day when I spoke to the guard, he seemed surprised. Hello, Mrs. Montoya. What are you doing here today? Hi, Fred. Can you see if my husband needs anything from home? I know I've asked before, but he might have found something he needs. Not likely. He's been moved to the penitentiary in Youngstown. He got a deal and started serving his time. Seven to ten years. Sent there two days ago. You didn't know? No. No, I didn't know. No one told me. He had been moved, accepted a deal. Why would he do that? He could have been found innocent or at least sent to a hospital for a short stay, then released. Why would he accept a deal? I turned and blindly walked out the door, realizing that my husband had decided to handle his future without me or our son. How could he be so cruel, especially to Reuben, his only son? Me, I understood. His anger at me was too new and too raw. But his son? I called my lawyer, the one Carmine didn't want to use, and asked him to find out what happened. He called back later that day and said Carmine had pleaded guilty. He got his charge reduced to simple assault and received a sentence of 7 to 10 years in Ohio State Prison. My lawyer also talked to Carmine's court-appointed lawyer. Carmine refused to appeal or try for a shorter sentence. He started his sentence earlier this week. That's when I lost hope. It became real. My husband wasn't coming home soon. I was truly alone now, alone with my son, Carmine's son. He was all I had, and my memories. Those memories made my nights awful. My son helped during the day, but at night, in bed alone, the memories came. It's surprising how the mind keeps going back to painful memories. I remembered Carmine standing there, the look on his face when he found me with Hugo. I remembered him holding the bat, the blank look on his face. I remembered the dead look in his eyes as the police took him away. I didn't remember Hugo at all. That part was blank. So much for that. A week after Carmine started his sentence, I got a new bed and got rid of the old one. Sleeping in that old bed reminded me too much of my mistakes and kept me from sleeping well. The new bed helped for a few days. I also had the house appraised and talked to a realtor just in case. 
I was living on the money we had left in our accounts, but I would need a job soon to bring in more money. During this time, Hugo got better and asked me to visit him. I went to see him just to tell him we were no longer in contact and he wasn't welcome in my life or home anymore. While we talked, Hugo made it clear he wanted me to continue being close to him or he would sue Carmine for damages. He said he would make sure Carmine never had any money once he got out of prison. He laughed as he told me this. I listened, shocked at how awful he was. How had I never noticed this before? When Hugo was done with his threats, I stood up, looked him in the eye, and threatened to sue him for harassment. He laughed, but I was serious. I picked up the phone next to his bed and asked if I should call my lawyer now. He sputtered and argued, but finally agreed to stop. I put the phone down and walked out. As I was leaving, he made one last threat. I promise you this, you little witch. When Carmine gets out, I'll ruin his life. He'll be sorry he ever hit me, and you won't be able to stop it because of my injuries. I walked out the door, thinking his words were just empty threats. Almost a year later, I decided to start my life without Carmine. I didn't want to, but I had no choice. I decided to file for divorce, sell the house, and buy something smaller for me and Reuben. There was more than enough money from the house and the insurance if I managed it right. I wanted to make sure Reuben had a college fund. That was not negotiable. I also looked for a job and found one as a receptionist at a small veterinary clinic. It was a good job, the people were nice, and the money was enough when combined with what I had. I wrote Carmine a letter along with the divorce papers, asking him to talk to me and let me explain why I was filing. It was because I needed to take care of Reuben and myself. I also hoped to see if there was any way we could still be a family. I waited until I got a note back from Carmine. He congratulated me on my new life with Hugo. He also said everything we had was mine and he wanted nothing. He would agree to whatever terms I set but wanted to be free of me. I expected nothing else, but seeing it in his handwriting was so final. I lost it then. I couldn't help myself. I spent the next day crying, much like I did after betraying him. After getting that out of my system, I wrote a small note back to him, saying Hugo and I never spoke after that day, and that I no longer worked for the same company. It was pointless, and wouldn't change things. But I couldn't let him go on believing Hugo was part of his son's life. I made sure the prison doctor gave it to him. That was all I could do. I had to move forward to provide for me and our son. Once the divorce was final, I sold the house, not without some regret. It was worth a lot, and I put three quarters of the money into an account for Carmine. He didn't have to know about it until he got out. I owed him that. I found a small house just right for Reuben and me, close to the clinic where I worked, and bought it outright. I wouldn't have to worry about a mortgage. I enrolled Reuben in school and he quickly made friends and adjusted. He stopped asking about his father when I told him Carmine was gone and too far away to see us. We began a new life and time passed. Several years later, Reuben mentioned Carmine again. When he was 12, he asked why his father was in prison. It was a question he kept asking and I kept trying to avoid telling him the truth. I tried to brush it off with nice words like I always did. But this time, he wouldn't let it go. Someone told him that his dad was in prison for almost killing a man, and Reuben wanted to know everything. I decided it was time to tell the truth. I sat him down and told him all the details. Reuben listened quietly. After I finished, he said, I don't blame dad for what he did. He had to do it. Then he walked away and never brought it up again. I thought he would be mad, but he wasn't. He just accepted it and moved on. Or so I thought. When I was in seventh grade, my best friend Eddie told me he found a newspaper clip in his mom's stuff. It said my dad was arrested for trying to kill a man. I didn't want to believe it, but he showed me the clip. I read it twice, and it was true. My dad was arrested for nearly beating a man to death with my baseball bat. It happened when I was nine, and that was the last time I saw him. He must have gone to jail right away because he never came home after that. Mom wouldn't tell me what happened then, and said I had to wait till I was older. I kept the clip and asked her straight out that night to tell me what happened. She didn't want to, but I kept asking until she made me sit down and told me everything. She said it was her fault because she made a big mistake. She was in bed with her old boss when Dad came home and saw them. She said he had a breakdown, but it wasn't his fault. He was very tired from working at the hospital for over 30 hours without sleep. When he saw them together, he lost control. He took my baseball bat and hit the man several times before she made him stop. 
She said the man healed without any problems, but dad couldn't get over hurting someone. He wanted to pay for what he did. She tried to get him a lighter sentence, but he was too angry to accept her help. He wanted nothing to do with her after what he saw. Instead, he insisted he was guilty and went to prison for seven years. I listened and understood what she did. I read stories and saw things online. I knew she cheated on my dad. She admitted it and didn't try to lie. I thought that was brave, even if it made me mad at her. I asked why dad wouldn't see us. She said he was too proud to let me see him in jail. When I asked if she visited him, she looked very sad and said dad wouldn't talk to her at all. He hadn't spoken to her since the day he saw her with that other man. I asked why he wouldn't talk to her, and she said he couldn't forgive her for what she did. He was very hurt and wanted to forget about her. She didn't say he wanted to forget about me, so I kept that in mind. I thought about what mom told me, and realized it was why I heard her cry at night. I knew she missed dad because I heard her talk to Aunt Eileen about it. Aunt Eileen was still friends with us, even after mom hurt her brother, my dad. I heard mom tell her one day that she had pictures of me she wanted Eileen to send to dad. Eileen said she would do it. I felt better knowing dad would see what I looked like. I hoped I looked like him. I didn't say anything more to mom and let her think I had forgotten about it, but I hadn't. I talked to Eddie and he suggested I talk to a teacher I trusted. This teacher was cool and treated us like adults. I told him about my dad and asked how I could get in touch with him. He said he would check and get back to me. A week later, he asked me to stay after class. He told me who to call for information. I thanked him and made a plan. Eddie had an idea that I buy a cheap phone. He said I could buy one at the store, pay for it up front, and use the minutes until they ran out. I had enough money saved, so we went to the CVS and bought one. I waited until I was alone and called the Department of Corrections in Columbus. I asked for information about Carmine Montoya. When they asked my relationship, I lied and said I was his son and 18 years old. They believed me and gave me the information. I knew where he was and how to call the prison. But when I called, they said my dad had left clear instructions on who could call him. I wasn't on the list. They wouldn't let me talk to him, but I could call for information about him. They said I could. After that, I called every few months to see if anything had changed. Nothing did. It stayed the same for the next two years. The time between my calls got longer with each failure to talk to him. Then, on my 15th birthday, I called again. That was the day they told me my dad was released on parole a month ago. He was out of prison. He was free. It was the best birthday present ever. When I asked if they had a number where I could reach him, they gave me one. I had a number to call to reach my dad. I decided not to tell mom. She would try to stop me from contacting him. I knew that for sure. She would say it would hurt him if I called him. He wanted us to go on without him, she said. I heard her, but I couldn't accept it. No way, not my dad. I was going to talk to him no matter what. And anyway, she was the one sending him my pictures, so he had to think about me when he got them. I called the number they gave me and got this man who said he was my dad's parole officer. I told him who I was and that I wanted to talk to my dad. He said he would get in touch with dad and tell him but it was up to my dad if he wanted to call me back. I understood, but I still hoped. I gave him my number, and he promised to call dad and let him know. I hung up feeling excited. I was close to talking with my dad. I hadn't seen him since I was a little kid, and I really missed him. I remembered him coming into my room at night and kissing my forehead. It was silly stuff, but I loved it. I never told anyone, but I did. It was a week later, a week that felt like forever, that I got a call on my cell phone. I still had it and kept it on and charged, even though I never used it to call anyone else. It was just for my dad. I was walking home with my friend Eddie when it rang. I stopped in the middle of the sidewalk, frozen. It was dad. He called me. What do I do? I stood there staring at Eddie until he said, answer it, stupid. Hello? I held my breath. Hi, is this Ruben? Ruben Montoya? The voice was deep and kind of soft but clear. I would have known that voice anywhere. I heard it sometimes in my dreams. It was him. Dad, is it really you? Yeah, it's me. Does your mom know you called me? Is she there now? No. I got a cheap phone, you know, the ones you just buy and activate. She doesn't even know I have this one. I was afraid you'd call when I was home. I didn't tell her I was going to call you. Actually, I've been calling the prison for the last year or so, just waiting for you to be let go. They wouldn't let me talk to you or even give you a message, so I called every few months. Who gave you my PO's number? What's a PO? He's my parole officer, the one you called. Who gave you his number? The prison. Dad, where are you? Are you coming home now that you're out? 
Reuben, that's no longer my home. Your mom and I are divorced and it's for the best. She's moved on and that's how it should be. You know that. That's not true, Dad. She never goes out on dates and she never sees any men. She still cries at night sometimes and she's sorry for what she did. She misses you, I know. She doesn't talk about you, but that's just to make it easier on me. She told me what she did and she made a mistake. You have to come back. You have to. No, Reuben, I don't have to. It's better for both of you if I'm not around. I'm a con, an ex-prisoner, and I've spent the last five years in prison with other tough guys. I don't even know how to live by myself yet. I'm still learning not to get angry and hit back when someone bothers me. No, I'm not the father you remember. Dad, please. I want to see you, talk to you. I want to know you again. I was just a kid when you went away. I'm 15 now, almost a man. Let me come to where you are, just once, at least one time. There was silence on the other end, and I thought he had hung up. I was about to say something more when he said, let me think about this for a while. I promise, I'll call you back. I need to decide what is best. Is that okay? Can you wait? Of course I could wait if I had to. I didn't want to, but I did want to see him, and if I pushed too hard, he would just hang up and ignore me like adults did. Sure, Dad, I can wait. I'll keep the phone turned on. It's best if you call during the afternoon. Mom is usually working then, so it'll be private. Is that okay? That's just perfect. So, I'll call you. There was a pause, not very long, before he said, Goodbye, son. I pushed the end button on the phone and just stared at it. So what'd he say? What'd he say to you? Come on, Reuben, what'd he say? Eddie was hopping around me, waving his hands in frustration. He said he'd think about it and call me back. I know he's going to let me see him. I just know it. I'll get to see my dad. Cool, man. He's really tough, an ex-con. He almost beat a guy for messing up his yard. That's cool, man. That's really cool. Eddie was grinning from ear to ear, but I didn't like the words he was using. Stop it, Eddie. He's my dad, not an ex-con. You just forget that part. It's no one's business but his and mine. You can know, but you have to forget it. Sure, Rube. I'll keep it secret, just between you and me. And if he comes, you have to introduce me. You promise? Sure, I promise. But I knew that if he called me back, I would keep it between him and me. My dad. I was going to see my dad after all these years. I was on pins and needles for the next few days waiting for his call. It was a Monday afternoon, just a week since I talked to him, and I had begun to think he was not going to call me back when my phone finally rang. It was just past three o'clock in the afternoon, and I was on my way home from school. Eddie was not with me today, since he had band practice on Monday and Wednesday. I was alone, and in no hurry to go home to an empty house. Hi, Dad. Is that you? Sure is. Can you talk? Where are you right now? I'm alone and walking home. Mom doesn't get home for another hour and a half. I have a lot of time. Good. I've given it a lot of thought and I do want to see you. I just want to get together once to say some things to you that are important. But I want you to understand that this is not an attempt to get our family back together. I know that's what you want, but it's not going to happen. Do you understand that? If you don't, I won't do this, he said firmly. I wasn't ready to say yes, but I knew I had to agree if I wanted to see him. So I told him what he wanted to hear. Sure, Dad. I get it. I won't tell Mom or anyone. Just tell me what you want me to do. Okay, you get out of school at 3 o'clock and walk home. You call your mom to let her know you're home. Is that right? How do you know all that? Who told you? I was really surprised. Was he already here? Was he watching me? I know people and they do favors for me. Someone checked on you for me. Is what I said right? Yes, it's pretty close. So what do I do? Nothing special. I'll come one day next week. Just do your normal routine and I'll find you. It's better if you don't know exactly when. Do you understand? My heart was racing with happiness. I promised I understood. I'd keep it a secret from Eddie and of course mom couldn't know. I was so happy I could wait another week. It had been almost seven years since I saw my dad. Seven years. Now I was going to see him. I had just finished washing one of the dogs when Reuben called. It was a cute little white poodle, almost 10 months old. He was happy now, not knowing what was coming. Actually, it wouldn't hurt and he wouldn't remember. I wrapped him in a towel and placed him on the table to finish drying him. His tongue tried to reach my face as I rubbed him with the towel. I answered my phone while working on the poodle. He was quiet and almost asleep, enjoying the attention. Hi, honey. Are you home? I asked. Yeah, Mom, I'm home. What do you want to do about dinner? Should I start something or should I order takeout? Hearing his voice made me feel at peace, knowing he was safe. 
He would be going out more soon, but until then, he was my whole world. That sounds good. Why don't you order Italian since you love it? I'll pick it up on my way home. Sound good? Okay, Mom. I'll get pasta and the garlic bread you like so much. I'm having a meatball sandwich. See you soon. Okay, honey. Bye. I put my phone away and finished drying the poodle. He was a sweet dog and didn't fuss when I put him back in the cage to wait. I cleaned up and clocked out at 4.30. The late shift would handle the operation. I mostly did exams, shots, and helped with x-rays and teeth cleanings. Dr. Jane, the veterinarian, hired me and taught me everything. She gave me this job when I really needed it. I never told her the full story, just that my actions led to my husband leaving. She never pushed, just offered a listening ear. I changed clothes and shut my locker. There were eight of us, each with our own locker and mail slot. I didn't bother with a lock, trusting my co-workers. I punched the time clock, waved to the girls starting their shift, and left. I was talking to myself about errands when my phone rang. The caller ID said Columbus, but no name. I thought it was a salesman, but answered it anyway. Hello, this is Nancy. How can I help you? I said. There was silence. Hello, is anyone there? Someone cleared their throat. Nan, this is Carmine. I stopped so fast I almost fell. My heart was pounding, my face felt hot, and I realized I hadn't been breathing. I had to say something. C Carmine? Is this really you? I asked, though I knew his voice. I had heard it over and over for seven years. I remembered him telling me about an accident at work, how he had to stay and help. I got angry because I wanted to go shopping. That was the last thing he said to me, telling me he couldn't take me shopping. It's really me. I had to let you know that Reuben contacted me. Did you know that? Did he tell you? His voice was calm like the old Carmine. No anger, no pain. But I didn't hear the love we used to share. Why did I think there would be any after all this time? No, I didn't know. How did he contact you? What did he want? And how did you get my cell number? Only Reuben has it. He has a prepaid cell phone. I don't know how he got it, but he called the prison, got my parole officer's info, and then called him. He told me, and I called Reuben. It was a lot for me to take in all at once. My husband, who I hadn't spoken to in almost seven years, called to tell me our son had contacted him. Carmine was out of prison. My son knew and called him. Reuben called his dad. I stood in the parking lot, staring into space, trying to make sense of it. Carmine was out of prison. That's all I could think about. Reuben had called him, but Reuben was smart and had been taking care of himself. I wasn't worried about him. And that he called his dad? It made sense. Reuben never stopped loving him, just like I didn't. I was surprised Reuben had a cell phone, but not that he made the call. Well, I'm not surprised, Carmine. You left us seven years ago, but he never forgot you. He asked about you for years after you left. I thought he had finally given up. I had no idea what happened to you since you cut all contact. The prison said you didn't want to talk to me. I didn't even know you were in prison until I tried to visit you. A guard had to tell me. And now, you're out and I had no idea. I gave up trying to reach out to you years ago, Carmine. I guess Reuben didn't. Carmine didn't respond immediately. I waited, but he didn't say anything. I thought he was done talking to me, so I said, Is that all? Just to let me know Reuben called you? I'll tell him you don't want to see us. That should make things easier for him. Still nothing. I was ready to hang up when Carmine spoke, shaking me to my core. Wait, wait, Nan, please. I'm sorry I'm not always polite. It's hard after five years in there. I sometimes forget to answer people, especially when I don't know them well. He sounded so sad. My heart ached for what he went through. But he chose to go there. I still felt bad, knowing it was partly my fault. I told Reuben I want to see him. I said I'd let him know when. I'd like to see you too, if that's all right. Oh, God. How could I see him without breaking down? How could I refuse? I built a life without him, a hard life, but mine. Now, he wanted to see us. I couldn't see him again. Reuben couldn't see him. He wouldn't stay, and it would break Reuben's heart. I had to say something to protect the life I built. I should tell him to stay away and never contact us again. That's what I should say. That would be fine, Carmine. We could meet wherever you want. Just tell me when and where. Let me call you back. I need to talk to my parole officer about traveling. I'll call you tomorrow. Good talking to you again, Nancy. Goodbye. Before I could say anything, he hung up. 
As quickly as he came back into my life, he was gone again. But he said he would call tomorrow. I would wait to talk to Reuben until I heard from him again. I didn't want to get Reuben's hopes up for nothing. I drove home to my son. We shared a meal of pasta and meatballs with lots of cheese and sauce. Reuben always ordered extra garlic bread and loved their lemonade. He ate with lots of energy and talked a lot. I could tell he had spoken to Carmine. He didn't know I knew and was trying hard to keep it a secret. I smiled inside at his happiness. He had talked with his dad. I needed to call Nan before trying to see Reuben, my son. If she thought I was going around her, she could make trouble with my parole officer. I didn't want any problems that could send me back to prison. While I had friends in there, I never wanted to return. Just sitting at my kitchen table and looking out the window at the busy street was a joy I rediscovered every morning. It was enough to keep me out of trouble. So, before I lost my nerve, I called Nan with the number the private investigator gave me. She answered, We talked, and the world didn't end. But it was harder than I ever expected. The call had gone better than I hoped. She was still angry at me for cutting her off, but I had no choice. She and Reuben were better off without me in prison. I might not have made it out alive, especially in the first couple of years. Things happened in prison that people rarely talk about. I was lucky, but I didn't know that at the time. I did the only thing I could and cut myself off from them. It cost me more than they could ever know. At least they had each other. I had no one but myself. I thought of my son a lot during those long nights. How had he grown? Was he a good kid? Did he have many friends? Was he popular? Eileen told me a lot and even had some pictures. I kept the pictures safe and dry while I was inside, but they weren't the same as the real thing. Still, I had them. I didn't have any pictures of Nancy, and Eileen never talked about sending me any. She knew I didn't want them. Later, I found out that Nancy was the one who gave Eileen the pictures to give me. I wondered why she didn't send any with her in them. When I asked to see both Nancy and Reuben, I think I was more surprised than Nancy. She seemed eager, but I thought I detected a pause in her voice. Maybe she didn't want to see me. If that was true, I could make it easy for her tomorrow when I called back. Let her off the hook. That might be what she wanted. Thinking about seeing her again gave me a sudden rush of energy. I'd tried to forget her during the trial. I even told my guards not to let her visit me. I didn't want to see the hurt in her eyes. I made the deal to go to prison just to avoid facing her. It wasn't brave, and I knew that. I was just scared. Scared she didn't love me anymore. Scared she wanted more than I could give. Scared she loved the guy I almost hurt. So I shut her out of my life. It was easier that way. Eileen told me that Nancy had sold the house and moved to a small town near Columbus. She and Reuben lived alone and Nancy worked at a vet's office. I didn't get it. She didn't need money. The house and my insurance would cover everything. When I asked Eileen, she just said that Nancy wanted it that way. Nancy wrote me a short note after I refused to talk to her before our divorce. She said she and Hugo were no longer in touch and that she had left her job there. That made me happy. I remember getting that note from the doctor in the infirmary. When I read it, I nearly cried. She didn't love Hugo. I kept that note in a box with other important things. In my small apartment, I looked at them every day, remembering and promising myself that it wouldn't happen again. Through Eileen, Nancy sent me notes on holidays, birthdays, and important events in Reuben's life. She told me when he graduated from grade school and when he became class treasurer in middle school. She sent me birthday cards, Valentine's cards, and Christmas cards. She told me about Reuben's best friend, Eddie, and how Eddie's family treated Reuben like one of their own. She signed each note, Love, Your Wife. I kept them all, but I never answered any of them. Now, I was ready for the first big change since I got out. Taking the job at Jason's clinic was easy. It allowed me to get my own place and start earning money again. I liked the work. It was about rebuilding lives, not just treating emergencies. It was peaceful, and I was good at it. They paid me well, better than I had ever earned before, and I was happy. I didn't want the chaos of the emergency room anymore. I wanted peace, and I had most of it now but this next step might mess things up for me. Tomorrow, I decided to visit my probation officer, Jack, to discuss my plans. I thought Jack might be hesitant, but I hoped to convince him. Jack had begun to trust me, calling only once or twice a month. He never embarrassed me with surprise calls at work. We even had beers together every few weeks. I like to think we could be friends after my probation ended. When I entered Jack's office, he was buried under a pile of paperwork. 
I found a clean chair and waited until he noticed me. Carmine, what are you doing here? You're not due for another few weeks. I need to ask you something, Jack. Maybe get a favor. Can we talk? Sure, I need a break. Want to grab a coffee? No, I'd rather just get to it if you don't mind. Go ahead, talk to me. I want to see my son and his mom. Reuben called me and we talked. He seems like a good kid and I want to see them both. I talked to Nancy, my ex, to make sure she knew Reuben had reached out. I didn't want her thinking I went behind her back, you know? Jack stared at me for a moment, rubbing his chin as he thought. He finally grinned, slapped his hand on the desk, and looked really happy. I knew it! Made a bet with my wife that you'd want to see them. Bet 20 bucks you'd want to go, Carmine. You do me proud. Hot damn. He stood up, rummaged through his desk, and found what he needed. He pushed some papers across the desk to me. Fill this out when you make your plans and drop it off here before you leave. I'll approve a five-day trip as long as you stay in Ohio since they live here. And make sure I have a phone number to reach you. I'll have to call at least once. No problem. I'll get one of those prepaid phones now that you let me have a credit card, though it's only got a $300 limit. Carmine, that card is a check card. It works with whatever you have in your checking account. You can get $300 cash a day, but you can still buy whatever you need like gas or a motel room. We talked a bit more. Jack told me to take it slow with the kid and my ex to not get mad or lose my temper, as if that would happen again. The prison therapists made sure of that. I think my head would blow up if I got too mad. I was ready for this trip. I just needed to find the courage to go. I waited until late to call Nan back, hoping Reuben would be in bed so I could talk to her alone. I dialed the number and waited. She answered on the second ring. She had been waiting. Was that a good sign? Hello, Carmine, is that you? It's me. Sorry it's late, but I had to see my parole officer and finish work at the clinic. Is Reuben in bed? He goes to bed early after doing his homework. Then he talks to his friends or watches a little TV. He's a good kid, Carmine. You'd be proud of him. I've always been proud of him, even when I was in prison. I had the pictures you sent and all the notes. Thank you. They helped a lot. You're welcome. I thought you'd want to know about him. I worried it might be too hard for you, but since you never asked me to stop, I kept sending them. I'm glad they helped. They did. So did all the notes you wrote me. I got them all. I didn't answer, but I got them. I'm glad. Did you make plans yet? Are you coming to see Reuben? Yes, I have five days to spend with him. I don't know if you want to see me. If you'd rather I just see him alone, I understand. I don't want to force you. Why would you think that? I would love to see you. It's always been your choice not to see or talk to me, not mine. I know, but I was afraid. Things are different now. I would like to see you both. Maybe we can be friends. I'd like that. There was silence on the other end. I worried I said too much. Damn, being social was hard. In prison, we said what we thought and dealt with it. At least some did. I had rank, so I was protected. I tried not to abuse that. Carmine, just come when you can and we'll go from there, okay? Yeah, okay, sorry, it's tough for me. I'll take next week off and travel on Sunday. I'll get a motel and call you from there. Would that be all right? Yes, that would be perfect. I can't take Reuben out of school. It's close to finals. You can pick him up after school and stay with him at our place until I get home. Is that okay? You trust me to pick him up alone? Without you? Carmine, you're his father. Of course I trust you. I'd trust you with his life. Thank you. I have to go. Goodbye. I'll call when I get there. I had to hang up before I lost it. She sounded so sincere. She'd trust me with his life, and I went to prison for almost killing a man. How could she trust me? It was too much. I found myself sitting on the bed, crying like a baby. But then I remembered. I had plans to make and things to do. I was going to see my son and Nancy. He called. I waited all day thinking he wouldn't, but he did. And he's coming to see us both. He wanted me to have the choice not to see him. What was that about? Did he think I didn't want to be with him again? How could he think that? He shut me out, not the other way around. I told him I wanted nothing more to do with Hugo and made sure he got the note. The doctor told me he read it and understood Hugo wasn't part of my or Ruben's life. But he's coming. I'll get to see him and talk to him. Maybe I can apologize for my mistakes. It was my fault he went to prison.
away from his life, work, and son. I need to tell him I'm sorry, that it wasn't because of anything he did. God, I was so selfish. Even now, when I remember how I thought back then, it makes me feel awful. Just awful. I wonder what he thinks of me now. Does he even remember me? Did he ever think of me all those years, like I thought of him? How many nights did he fall asleep wishing I was there? As many as I did, wishing to feel his body close to mine again. All those lost years, nights we could have spent together, before it all fell apart, before I ruined everything with my mistakes. What made it worse was that the last man I was with wasn't even my husband. It was Hugo, the man who broke up my marriage and sent the man I loved to prison. Hugo! It still makes me feel sick, sick in my heart and my stomach. When the memory comes back, especially on bad days, I end up on the bathroom floor, still wet from a shower that never seems to make me feel clean. And no matter what people say, time hasn't made it better. It's as clear in my memory as the day it happened. I hate it. I pray to forget it, but my prayers haven't been answered. Enough. It's done and over. Stop wishing and saying sorry repeatedly. It doesn't change anything. And stop waiting for something to punish you and then forgive you. Life doesn't work that way. In the real world, good people like Carmine suffer because of people like me. I stayed free to do as I wanted. Carmine was locked up for trying to protect what was his. Hugo got away with everything, paying no price. Sure, he got beaten up, but that wasn't much compared to the hurt he caused. And maybe I did pay a price. Losing the man I loved was a big price. Maybe that's a kind of punishment. Now that he called, I had to tell Reuben. I had to tell him about his dad wanting to see him and coming for five days. I wanted to tell him at home so I could manage his expectations. I didn't want him to hope for a family reunion. Carmine said it wasn't going to happen, to keep Reuben's hopes in check. Nothing was said about my hopes. But Reuben was my main concern now, tomorrow. I would tell him tomorrow after school. Tomorrow was Thursday, giving him three days to get ready. Three days was nothing after waiting seven years. Who was I kidding? Three days was forever for a kid. Should I wait until almost Monday? Would Carmine call when he got in? What if Reuben answered the phone? No, I would tell him tomorrow after school and be done with it. Good. Dad hasn't called back yet. I know he will. It's only been a week since we last talked. I would call him, but I don't know his number. He didn't give it to me, and the caller ID said it was blocked. Whatever that means. But I know he'll call. He said he would, and I believe him. I just have to be patient. That's what mom always says when I get anxious. Just be patient, she says. It will happen when it's supposed to happen. Sure. Just wait. Time goes so slow that it's hard to wait. But I have no choice. I'll wait. Why doesn't he call? At school today, we took a trip to see the water purification plant. Big deal. Like, I care how they make the water drinkable. It's safe to drink, so who cares? Anyway, I like bottled water and use my allowance to buy it as often as I can. Me and Eddie buy it and carry the bottles around all day. Sometimes I fill the empty bottle with water from the fountain, but it's still better than tap water. I listen to the guide talk about the big tanks, the algae, and the chemicals. I try to remember it all since the teacher will give us a quiz later. Luckily, I have a good memory for stuff like that. Eddie doesn't remember things well. He has a hard time with it, and I help him a lot. But he's my friend, so I do it. No big deal. All of this is just background in my head. Dad's call is what I really worry about. Why doesn't he call? Of course, now is the wrong time since he knows I'm at school. But I keep the phone on even in class. No one but Eddie knows I have it, so no one tells me to turn it off. He'll probably call tonight. I think he'll call tonight. It's been long enough, and he knows I'm waiting. That's what I would do if I were him. I'd call tonight. The day drags on. Eddie makes funny comments under his breath, and I struggle not to laugh. He wants to get me in trouble so he can tease me. That was too funny not to laugh at, so I do. And now the teacher is glaring at me. Eddie looks innocent while she glares at me. He knows I have to get even with him now. He'll be on guard. Makes it harder to get him back. But I will. Pretty soon, Eddie is talking to a girl in our class he likes. He wants us to double date sometime. But I told him my mom would freak out if I said I was going on a date. But there is this one girl. Anyway, after hours and hours of boring stuff... School is finally over, and Eddie and I walk home. I held my phone tightly, staring at it, hoping it would ring. It had a special sound, like little bells, so I would know it was mine. Eddie was watching me and looked annoyed. Come on, Rube. He'll call when he's ready. He's in trouble and needs permission to go anywhere. 
We don't know where he is, so it might take some time. You just have to wait, man. Yeah, I know, but it's been almost a week since he said he'd call. You think he changed his mind? Maybe he doesn't want to see me after all this time. No, man. He told you he'd call and he will. You just have to wait. He's in charge and knows what's best. Make sure you tell me when he calls. Got it? We walked along in silence, Eddie tossing a ball in the air while I followed him. When it was time to go separate ways, Eddie headed towards the nice homes, and I went towards the apartments. He still hadn't called. I felt down, but Eddie told me to be patient. What else could I do? I waved goodbye and went home. Mom wanted to know I was safe and sound. I understood. It was her way of caring. I went inside, locked the door, and called her. She sounded happy when she picked up, promising to share some exciting news when she got home. Probably about one of her pets. I left the phone on the table where she could find it when she got back. He still had time to call. He knew when mom would be home, so there was still time. I sat down with a Coke, staring at the phone, waiting. But when I heard her car pull in, I turned off the phone and hid it in my room, under the dresser. Maybe he'd call tomorrow. Mom came in with a pizza and some salads. During the week, she usually cooked, but tonight she must have been busy. Maybe she had other plans for us. Anyway, we had pizza. I loved pizza and didn't care why she chose it. I grabbed plates and napkins, and we sat down to eat. It was our favorite, pepperoni with extra cheese. From Pizza Hut, too. What a treat. I ate four pieces while Mom had one and a half. It was great. Full and happy, I smiled at Mom. Great meal, Mom. What's the special occasion? We don't have pizza often. Did you get a promotion or something? Mom smiled and looked pleased. She leaned back in her chair and said, Guess what? I know you have a cell phone, and I know you talk to your dad. Did you think you could keep that a secret from me? I was shocked. How did she know? Who told her? Eddie would never say a word. So who? Who told you? Who told you about my phone and dad calling? Mom grinned and laughed. Your father told me. He called to say you contacted him and that he wanted to come see both of us. He's coming Sunday night to spend a week with us. Really? Is he really coming this weekend? Where will he stay? Can he stay here? I'll give him my room and sleep on the couch or in your room. Can he stay here, Mom? Reuben, calm down. I don't know where he'll stay, but he said he'd call as soon as he gets here. He has five days with us, so there's plenty of time to figure it out. But Reuben, remember he's just visiting. He's not coming back to stay. Do you understand? Yes, I get it. I'm just excited to see him after all this time. I was a little kid when he left. He won't recognize me now. How will he know it's me? I sent pictures, and Eileen gave them to him so he knows what you look like now. He's your father. He would know you anywhere. Now listen, this is how it's going to be. First, you have to keep going to school. He will pick you up after school and bring you home. Then you can talk and get to know each other. I'll see you both when I get home from work. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. He'll pick me up after school. I want to introduce Eddie to him. Eddie wants to meet him too. Can Eddie come with us and then go home from there? Would that be okay, Mom? That sounds good. Now let's see what we have and what we need before he comes. Let's make a list. Now the decision was made. I knew I had to see Reuben again. It had been over seven years since I last saw or talked to him. He must have grown so much. The pictures showed him looking very different from the boy I remembered. I still thought of him as a nine-year-old, but that was the past. He's a young man of 15 now. He would almost be a stranger to me and I to him. But that feeling would go away once we met again. And Nancy, how would she feel about me coming back? I shut her out when things got tough. Sure, I had my reasons and I thought they were good ones, but would she understand now? And what about what she did? How did I feel about that? While time had moved on, many of our plans and dreams had faded. When I tried to picture Nancy now, I couldn't see her in my mind. Maybe too much had passed for us to rebuild our friendship. We had too many questions with no solid answers. Whatever the future held, my path was in front of me. There was no going back or undoing the past. I knew we had all paid a price for what happened. If I was being honest, I thought the price was paid in full. Now, everything was new and the past had no part in it. I learned that in prison. It was a good lesson. We all believed it and lived by it. I finished packing my few things and tossed the suitcase into the back of my truck. I climbed in, started the engine, put it in drive, and was on my way. I lived in the northwest part of Columbus, not far from the clinic which was closer to the Brookside Country Club. For me, this would be an easy trip, just a short drive to Groveport. I had reservations at a Holiday Inn and promised to be there by six in the evening. 
No problem. I drove, feeling the freedom to do something I hadn't done since I got out of prison. Travel. It was still strange at times to be free. I arrived at the Holiday Inn at five o'clock and checked in. My credit card limit wasn't a problem now, but old habits die hard. So, to be safe, I decided to pay most of the room cost in cash and not test my new credit card limit. To avoid any issues, I gave the clerk $300 at check-in and asked her to use it before charging my card. The girl behind the counter smiled and nodded. Maybe this wasn't an unusual request. I found my room, unpacked my few things, and settled in. With little to do, and not wanting Reuben or Nan to know I was here already, I decided to drive to Reuben's school. Maybe, if I felt brave enough, I could drive by their place and see where they lived. With that thought, I got into my truck and followed the directions Nan gave me to Reuben's school. Twenty minutes later, I found the school and was now on my way to their address, following the route Reuben walked every day. I found the main boulevard she mentioned and, after driving for several minutes, saw the name of her street on a sign. I followed it for another half mile before I saw the subdivision. I pulled into one of the streets the same name as her address, and in just a few more minutes, saw the place. It was a small, one-story home, similar to others around it. Hers was set back from the street a bit more than its neighbors. It was painted light blue with darker blue shutters. The yard and shrubs were well cared for. It looked different from where we lived before I went to jail, not just in size and location, but the whole feel of it. That my son and my ex-wife lived there was a bit hard for me to grasp. As I slowed down, I saw two bikes in the driveway. Inside the open garage door, I saw an older model Ford sedan. I continued slowly past and glimpsed into the backyard. I spotted two young boys sitting around a small table, clearly playing some electronic game. The one I didn't know was gesturing to the other. That had to be Reuben. I had pictured him so often in my mind that I knew him instantly. The photos Nan sent helped, but I didn't need them. I'd know my son anywhere. I slowed and stopped right there on the street. Seeing my son was too tempting to just drive by. I watched them interact, their friendship clear even from where I sat. Then, as I was about to leave, I saw her. She came out of the house with two cans of soda for the boys. They stopped their game and took the cans, nodding their thanks. She stood there talking to them and looking around the yard. I was too far to see her face well, but I was surprised to see she still wore tight jeans and a t-shirt. That memory stayed with me. Just as I was about to pull away, she turned and saw me. The tears that started when I first saw my son made it hard to see clearly, but I could tell from her reaction she recognized me. Panic hit, and I shoved my foot down on the gas pedal and sped away, gravel flying. I didn't slow down until I was out of sight and back on the main road leading to my hotel. I was shaking, so I drove carefully back to my room. I went inside and collected my thoughts until I felt calm. I decided a meal would help me think and figure out what to say when I called. I promised Nan I would let her know I was here and that I would pick up Reuben tomorrow after school. She trusted me with my son and I wasn't going to mess that up, not after seeing him today. So I walked down to the lobby where a small restaurant was located. I went in and had a meal. I ate without really tasting anything, just needing the nourishment. By the time I got back to my room, it was past nine. Time to call. I sat, picked up the phone, and dialed. The phone rang twice before she answered. Hello? Hi, Nancy. It's me, Carmine. I'm here as promised, and I just wanted to let you know I'll pick up Reuben as we agreed. I guess I'll see you when you get home. Is that still okay with you? It's fine, Reuben. A slight pause, then. I saw you today, you know. That was you in the truck, wasn't it? Yes, Nan, it was me. I'm sorry for that, but I had to see where you and Reuben were living. I panicked when you turned around and I left quickly. It's hard for me sometimes to remember that not everything I do that seems wrong is really wrong. Does that make sense? I think so, but I haven't had to live like you did for five years. I imagine it makes things strange sometimes. You have no idea, but I wouldn't want you to go through it yourself. No way. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow. Should I bring anything or worry about anything? Nothing at all, Carmine. Just be yourself. You're his father, and that's all that matters to him. He never blamed you. When I explained what I did and why you acted the way you did, he said, I don't blame Dad for doing what he did. He had to do it. That's how your son feels, Carmine. Maybe it's a good thing I came, Nan. He has to understand that what I did was wrong. 
That's why I went to jail. Because what I did was wrong. He has to know that. I don't want him to think what I did was right or justified. It wasn't. But Carmine, he understands that I caused you to act that way. It wasn't your fault. It was mine, and he knows that. I told him what I did when you came home. No, Nan, you're wrong. I'll talk to you tomorrow, both of you. I'll make you understand. Until then, good night. I hung up before I lost my temper. How could she not see? Her actions were never a reason for almost hurting a man. There are other options. Violence is not one of them. I saw the result of violence at the hospital, and I hated those who caused such pain. I called them terrible names. I let out my anger on them and their harmful actions. I cursed them and their actions. Then I did the very thing I hated in others. The thing I was so against. And how could she think I would put my son through a public trial? Any actions she or I did would reflect on our son, and even on Nancy herself as the facts came out. She had to know that. How could she not? I slept poorly that night, anxious about seeing and talking to my son for the first time in so long, and for what I had to make them understand about what I did and why I went to jail. They had to understand before I could go back to my job and my new home. I had to make them see that I was wrong. I had to make them see. He called last night. I heard the phone ring and I knew it had to be him. He was here in Groveport and he had come to see me. After all this time, my dad was here and he was coming to see me. I wanted to answer the phone myself, but I knew mom would be upset if I did. She made me promise to wait and do it dad's way. She told me if I didn't, dad might stay away. I thought she was crazy, but she knew him better than I did. So I heard the phone ring and I just knew. I fell asleep thinking about what was going to happen tomorrow. The next day was one of the longest in my life. I told Eddie that dad would pick us up after school and then I would have some time alone with him just the two of us, until mom got home. Then we would all be together again like before. I remember dad coming home smelling like chemicals, his face tired, and then after a shower, he was my dad again. We laughed a lot, and mom hardly ever got sad or mad like she does now. And then everything changed. Dad went away, mom cried all the time, and things were not so good anymore. Oh yes, I remembered. Finally it was 3.30, and the bell rang for the last class of the day. I grabbed my books, threw them in my locker, and locked it before heading to the big double doors at the front of the school. They would be open now, and kids would be pouring out, heading home. I stopped by the display case just inside the doors to wait for Eddie. He finally came down the hall, and we ran out the front doors and down the 16 steps to the ground. Eddie and I ran out to the front of the school and stopped, looking around. Then I saw him. He was standing in front of an old red Ford pickup truck, one that looked many years old. But that wasn't important. What mattered to me was that he was there. I knew him right away. I remembered him, and I knew him right then. Come on, Eddie, there he is. There's my dad, come on. I grabbed Eddie by the arm and started pulling him toward my dad. Dad watched us, then stepped away from the truck to wait for me. When I got there, I just stopped in front of him and stared at this man I hadn't seen in seven years. He looked at me and smiled. Then, without warning, he grabbed me and hugged me tight, lifting me off the ground. Dad... Come on, Dad, you're squeezing me. Put me down. I was laughing and crying at the same time, and I wasn't ashamed. This was my dad. He finally let me go, stepped back, and said, I'm sorry, son, I didn't mean to embarrass you, and who's your friend? Is this the famous Eddie? Eddie puffed up his chest and said, Hi, Mr. Montoya, it's good to meet you. I'm Eddie, Rube's best friend. Me and him are buddies, right, Rube? I nodded, still watching my dad. After all these years, he was finally here. I was trying to catch my breath. We got into the truck and drove off, heading to our place. Eddie came with us until the junction. Dad offered to drive Eddie the rest of the way, but Eddie said no. He didn't want Dad to see his house. Eddie was embarrassed his parents had money and we didn't. But I didn't think it was so bad. I promised to call Eddie later and we continued home. Dad seemed to remember exactly where to go, and we got there pretty fast. I spent the next few hours with Dad, catching up. I told him everything about Mom and me since we moved. I couldn't remember much before that, but he didn't mind. He was just happy to listen. I felt like a dam had burst inside me. As we talked, I looked at him, comparing him to how I remembered. He was quieter now, didn't laugh or talk as much, and seemed sadder. He still looked the same, tall, not too heavy, with dark hair that had some gray now. His eyes weren't as bright as I remembered. His voice was the same, too, deep with the same laugh and grin. He was the same, but also different. 
Dad ordered pizza and we drank Pepsi while we talked until mom came home. Dad got really quiet when I said I heard her car. She was on time as always. He stood up to watch her come in. She put her keys on the hall table, took off her jacket and dropped her purse on a chair. She didn't look up until she finished her routine. They stood there, staring at each other. I was about to say something to ease the awkwardness when the doorbell rang. I think it was the pizza guy. I couldn't focus at work today. My mind was on Reuben and his father. I knew it was good for Reuben to see his dad and that Carmine needed this too. I trusted Carmine with Reuben's life. Carmine went to prison to spare Reuben from seeing him like that. He told me that and I believed him. He gave up his freedom partly for his son. I glanced at the clock. Just over an hour to go. They were probably at home now, catching up. Reuben had so much to tell his dad and many questions to ask. I finished grooming a Labrador, giving him a flea dip, trimming his coat, and cutting his nails. He was a sweet dog and very patient. As I talked to him, it felt like he understood me better than most people. I placed him in his cage and saw that my shift was over. It was time to face my past. I washed up, changed out of my smock, and put on my jacket. Routine things. I said my goodbyes and drove home. Time to see Carmine for the first time since that day with Hugo. I remembered that day clearly. I wished I could forget it, but I couldn't shake Carmine's look of pain and betrayal from my mind. Why couldn't I forget it? After all it cost me, lost in thought, I reached my driveway. The red pickup truck confirmed it. Carmine was there. I recalled him once talking about owning a truck. I turned off the ignition, grabbed my purse and jacket, and sat there trying to gather courage. I hadn't fixed dinner or planned for takeout. What did Carmine like now? Had his taste changed? I knew I was stalling. I walked slowly to the door, unlocked it, and stepped in. I dropped my keys and jacket in their usual spots, hesitating to look up. Carmine always stood when I came in. Always. I took a deep breath and looked up. He was standing in the doorway to the kitchen where he and Reuben had been sitting. I looked into his eyes and saw my Carmine. He was still there. Not the same as before, but there. Less happiness and more pain now. No sign of the old cheerfulness. Carmine was here, but he had changed. Only time would show if these changes would last, and if they were good. I was about to say something to break the awkward silence when the doorbell rang. I jumped a little and almost screamed when Reuben said, that's the pizza dad ordered. Can you let him in, Mom? Chapter 14 Carmine The doorbell's sound stopped the tense silence between Nancy and me. Seeing her for the first time in many tough years left me speechless. My feelings were a mess, and I needed time to sort them out. I felt happiness, which was strange. I thought I would feel anger or sadness because she had turned my life upside down. I knew those other feelings were deep inside me, too. I had felt them all last night when I first saw her, but now, being this close, happiness was all I felt. Nan turned to open the door. I used those few seconds to take a deep breath and calm down. I needed to stay careful. My feelings were all over the place and my control was shaky. I had learned patience in prison, but that was for things I could predict and control. It wasn't meant for dealing with wives or kids. Prison is not a place for feelings. It's a tough place where only the strong survive. Those who are smart or skillful find ways to get by. The weak have to rely on others, often losing their pride. I was one of the lucky ones. I knew when to take advantage for my own benefit. In prison, caring isn't useful. My caring side had been gone for a long time. Working at the clinic was helping me remember how to care again. But for now, my cold, distant thinking from prison guided me as I dealt with Nan. That's just how it was after spending five years, six months, and three days in a small cell. Coming back to normal life wasn't easy, especially after being alone for two years. The only social contact I had was at the clinic, helping people with their own pain and sadness. Watching Nan take the pizza and pay the delivery boy reminded me to be polite. Please, Nan, I ordered pizza since Reuben told me he liked it, but I should have asked you. I'm sorry. Here, I have the money. I gave the delivery boy $20 and told him to keep the change. Money wasn't a problem for me now, thanks to my job at the clinic and my simple life. I had money, but no real life. Nancy walked to the kitchen with the pizza. She probably needed time to control her own feelings, too. Maybe this visit was a mistake, but it was too late to change it now.
After the delivery boy left, I closed the door and went to the kitchen. Reuben and Nancy were already sitting. I hesitated, then took the empty chair, which made me feel uneasy. That spot should have been Nan's, not mine. But as a guest, I had no choice since the other chair held the pizza. Nancy put paper plates in front of us. She took out pizza slices with her fingers. She gave the first slice to Reuben, who happily rolled it up and took a bite. When she gave me my slice, she looked into my eyes briefly. I felt a strange happiness again. She held my gaze for a moment, then looked away and sat down. I wondered what her blue eyes were saying. I used to know what she was thinking, but not anymore. Not since the day I lost control, almost hurt someone badly, and my life changed forever. I pushed these thoughts aside and talked with Reuben. He told me about his friend and their summer plans. They wanted to join the Y swim team and compete with other Ys. He and his friend Eddie were good swimmers and hoped to win medals. I listened quietly and enjoyed hearing my son's voice. I realized what I had missed and almost lost by shutting them out of my life. I thanked God Reuben had called me out of my self-imposed isolation. Reuben showed wisdom beyond his years. After eating three slices of pizza, he said he had to go to Eddie's for a project. He promised to be back in an hour and asked me to wait for him. I said I would. He looked at his mother, who smiled and kissed his forehead before walking him to the door. She whispered something in his ear, making him blush and rush out. Instead of wondering what she said, I noticed the close bond between them. I didn't care about their secret. I understood the value of secrets. I certainly had my own. As the door closed, Nancy turned to me and asked if I would join her in the small family room after she made us some coffee. I nodded and moved into the room, noting the couch and the two side chairs. I tried one of the side chairs, but it was uncomfortable, so I moved to the couch. Those side chairs were really uncomfortable for someone my size. They felt like they were made for women. I wasn't surprised when Reuben said he was going over to Eddie's. I knew he wanted to give me time alone with Carmine. I walked Reuben to the door, whispered thank you in his ear, and made him blush. He left quickly. I turned to Carmine and asked him to join me in the family room for coffee. In the kitchen, I poured coffee into a nice pitcher and added two cups to a small tray. Carmine liked his coffee black, or at least he used to, and I liked mine with a bit of cream. I fixed the cups and carried the tray into the family room. Carmine was on the couch and I put the tray on the table in front of him and joined him on the couch. We sat at opposite ends, of course. I had thought about this meeting so many times over the years. I knew it would happen someday. I had practiced what I would say over and over. I remembered every word I wanted to say clearly. Now was the time, and I had to start. I handed Carmine his cup of coffee, and when he took it, I placed my hand over his on the cup and looked into his eyes. I opened my mouth to start the story about what happened that day and why things went the way they did, but those weren't the words that came out. Instead, I said, Carmine, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. Can you ever forgive me? When she sat down on the couch, I felt a bit uneasy, but since she sat far away, I relaxed. Being this close was more than I had expected. I thought we would sit across the table from each other, our hands neatly folded, our faces calm. I would tell her about my life with Jerry and what I was doing, then she would tell me about her life. Maybe she would tell me about Reuben, too. Well, that was what I thought would happen. Instead, she said, Carmine, I'm so sorry for what I did to you. Can you ever forgive me? I didn't know how to respond to that. I had moved on from that long ago. I chose to go to jail. It had little to do with her actions. I nearly killed that Hugo guy back then, and that was my fault. I knew I gave her plenty of reasons to do what she did. I worked all the time, leaving her alone to raise our son and manage the house. When I had a chance to change jobs, she let me refuse it because she thought that's what I wanted. She shouldn't have done what she did, but I wasn't perfect either. I could have easily said, divorce her, kick her out for cheating, and acted all high and mighty. But cheating can be dealt with. I loved her and I believed she loved me, so there had to be a reason for what she did. I never asked her why. And why would I ruin our son's home and break up our family because of my pride? Sure, some men would do that, but I loved my son and my wife. What right did I have to destroy all of that for my own pride? Nancy looked at me with surprise on her face. Her words seemed to shock her as much as me. I needed to say something. I closed my mouth and thought about what to say. I decided to just go with it and see what happened. 
I put my cup down, leaned toward her, and said, I forgave you years ago, Nan. I didn't go to jail to punish you. I went to punish myself for what I did. You need to understand that. I went to jail because I almost killed a man. No one deserves to die for that. And if you hadn't stopped me, I would have killed him. Her eyes widened, and her mouth formed a small O. I hoped she understood what I was trying to say. I didn't want her to blame herself anymore. It wasn't her fault that I did what I did. At the time, the lawyers wanted me to plead temporary insanity or something like that. If I had been thinking straight, I might have just gotten very angry, yelled a lot, and maybe even divorced her. But I wouldn't have tried to kill Hugo with a bat. I'm sorry I couldn't talk to you then, Nan. I know you wanted me to plead not guilty, but I couldn't. I would have killed him if you hadn't stopped me. I would have kept hitting him with that bat until I passed out. You saved me from doing something unforgivable. When I woke up and realized what I almost did, I felt frozen with fear. How could I almost do such a thing, even to you and Reuben? I couldn't put you and Reuben through a trial that would show my actions and put you on trial too. The newspapers would go crazy. Doctor's wife caught with lover, doctor goes mad. I couldn't do that to Reuben or even to you, Nancy. What I did was necessary. You have to understand that. How could I let my son see me like that? His friends at school would tease him about his crazy father or his mother. Nancy, they would have said those things, and you know it. I wasn't crazy, and you weren't bad. I did what I had to do. I paid for my mistake, and now it's over. I just want to move on and live in society again. I want to know my son again. I've missed so much. Nancy listened while I spoke. I could tell it hurt her by the way her lips trembled and how she cringed at certain parts. But I was being honest, and sometimes the truth hurts. Now it was her turn. I felt both sad and shocked by Carmine's words. He blamed himself for what he did. I didn't know he felt that way since the lawyer said he wasn't guilty of trying to kill Hugo because he was very tired from working long hours. Even the DA agreed but couldn't stop Carmine when he decided to plead guilty. But I could see his point of view, too. Carmine was a doctor because he wanted to help people, not for the money. He was well paid because he was good at his job. Carmine looked at what he did with horror and took full responsibility. That was who he was back then and who he still is. Most importantly, Carmine put Reuben and me first when this happened. He went to jail to spare us. That almost drove me crazy. He forgave me years ago. How could he have done that? What I did was hard to forgive. I hadn't even forgiven myself. That made me think about what Carmine had lived with all these years. He felt guilty and went to jail to make up for his mistake. But it was my fault. If I hadn't been with Hugo that day, none of this would have happened. Carmine had to know that. I saw that Carmine had finished speaking. Now it was my turn to say everything I had wanted to say all those years ago. I sat up straight, turned to face him and began, Carmine, you are wrong. This was never your fault. I started the events that ended with you going to jail. It was my fault that Hugo was in our bedroom. It was my fault that we were in bed together. It was my fault, Carmine, and you were caught up in my mistake. I knew what I was doing, and I knew it was wrong. I am sorry for everything you had to go through because of me. When I saw you with that bat and the look on your face, I knew my life was over. I was afraid you were going to kill Hugo, and that's why I tried to stop you. I couldn't let you go to jail for something that was my fault. I knew I made a terrible mistake. I knew it and had to stop you from killing him. Not to save him, but to save you. But when I saw your eyes, I was afraid. You were someone else then. That's what I told the lawyer, and he agreed that you were not yourself. Why didn't you let us save you from prison, Carmine? Why did you give up your son and your freedom for something I did? Carmine listened to me. His face was calm and his eyes were warm. He listened and heard me. I was sure of that but he was shaking his head, denying my words. I tried again. Please, Carmine, I know I hurt you and our family. Reuben paid the price for what I did. I paid a terrible price too, but it was right. I was guilty, not you. I can't forgive myself for what I did to you and the price you had to pay. I'll never forgive myself. Nancy, you must forgive yourself. I failed you and Reuben. I should have stayed and faced you. We could have tried to save our family. Maybe it wouldn't have worked and we would have separated anyway. But I didn't. I took a bat and tried to hurt a man instead of finding a better way through reason. And what I said about the papers was true. 
I spared you and Reuben the humiliation of a trial. It would have been a harsh trial. I couldn't let that happen to Reuben or even to you. And please, Nancy, forgive yourself. I have forgiven you. I have even learned to forgive myself for what I did. I looked into his eyes and believed him. He had forgiven me and himself and was at peace with what happened. But now I had a new thought. How did he feel about me? Was that a selfish thought? He was here to see his son, not me. I knew that. But the thought still nagged at me. I searched my heart for the courage to ask, Carmine, can I say something to you now? Something that you may not want to hear? Carmine smiled and nodded. Say anything, Nancy, and I'll listen. And I'll try to answer any questions you have. I still love you as much as I did before, Carmine. I never stopped loving you, and there's never been anyone else for me. Hugo has nothing to do with my feelings for you. Believe that. Now it was time for the real question. Carmine was just watching me, giving nothing away. I had to ask, Can I ask you something, Carmine? How do you feel about me? Carmine kept looking at me without showing any emotion. As I grew more nervous waiting for his answer, he stood up and walked to the window. He looked out at the street, his back to me, standing tall. I feared he would tell me he no longer felt anything for me. But that's not what he said. Nancy, my feelings are complicated. I never stopped loving you or Reuben when I went to jail. I thought I was doing the right thing for our family. I did it out of love for both of you. You need to understand that. But even though I took responsibility for making you feel you had to cheat, I still don't understand it. I've made peace with myself and with what you did. But it took a long time to heal. We both needed that time. So to me, our marriage had to end. It was time. Things were not going to change, and what happened was bound to happen. No, Carmine, no! It was me. I was the one who betrayed you and our family. It was all my fault. You were so tired and stressed that when you saw me cheating, you just broke. That was on me. It won't ever happen again. Never! Carmine shook his head, but turned to look at me with tearful eyes he refused to let fall. I wanted to go to him and hold him, but I was too scared. Not of Carmine, but of his reaction. I couldn't bear to be rejected by him. That would destroy me. No, Nan. Our marriage had to end. We had grown apart. I was always working, and you hated being alone. Reuben was all that was holding us together. I was so focused on my work that I often forgot about you and Reuben until I was on my way home. That was wrong. You and Reuben should have been my first priority. My job should have been just a job. I understand that now, and I'm doing what I should have done before. I work at a job I like, but it's not my life. But what about us, Carmine? What do we do now? Do we just see each other when you come to see Reuben or when I come to get him? After everything we were to each other, is that all that's left? I can't believe that, Carmine. I just can't. You and I are different people now, Nan. How do we know how we'll feel after some time? You remember me as I was. I'm not the same man anymore. I've learned terrible things and sometimes I react poorly. I can be dangerous. I have to remind myself every day that I'm free to make my own choices. That's a big responsibility for someone who never had many restrictions. When it was time to act responsibly, I almost killed a man without thinking. I should have been thinking about you and Reuben. I failed you. Carmine, you've been around others who failed, and now you think you will too. I don't believe that. You've changed. I see it in your eyes. You're still the man I loved. When you did those things, you weren't thinking straight. And for Reuben and me, you never failed us. I did. When someone needed you, you went. I should have stayed faithful, but I didn't. I still don't know why. Maybe I drank too much and fell for a bad person. That was my fault, not yours. And to let you know, Carmine, Hugo said he would come after you in court when you got out. He wanted to sue you. That's on me, too. You didn't fail us. I did. Carmine and I talked for the rest of the evening until Reuben came back. We resolved nothing, but we started to understand each other more. It felt strange, because sometimes it seemed so natural to sit and talk to him. Other times, the differences between the old Carmine and the new Carmine were clear. I found the new Carmine wonderful because I still loved the old one. Carmine wanted me to see that. Carmine and Reuben spent another hour talking about what they had been up to. It was great to see the bond between father and son still there. That hit me hard making me remember I broke that bond in the first place. But at least it wasn't a permanent break. Reuben started to get sleepy, his eyes closing even though he said he wasn't tired. 
I knew he hadn't slept much the night before. Carmine saw it too and told Reuben to go to bed, saying he'd still be around for a few more days. Reuben left smiling after Carmine hugged him and I kissed his cheek. Well, Nancy, I should go. What's your schedule like tomorrow? I'd love to spend more time with both of you, but we need to talk more. I'll get Reuben to school first, then I'll call and take some days off. I have lots of vacation time, so it shouldn't be a problem. Is that okay with you? That sounds great. I could take you out for breakfast if you'd like. I'm free any time. How about 8.30? We can have breakfast and talk more then. Perfect. Carmine stood up and walked towards the door. I followed him, wondering what tomorrow would bring. I hoped things could progress, but I didn't know what Carmine wanted. I stopped as he opened the door. He turned back and said, This went better than I hoped. Thank you for seeing me and for raising Reuben to be a fine young man. Good night. See you tomorrow. He left. This time I knew he would come back. As I drove to the motel, I thought about the evening. Reuben was a great boy, and I was impressed with him. Nancy had done a wonderful job raising him. I enjoyed my time with him and knew I couldn't leave his life again. I was here to stay. Nancy was just like I remembered. She looked just as beautiful as ever. From what I knew, she never went out with other men. That was interesting. But as I told her, our marriage was over. We were different people now. But then I wondered, how did I feel about her now? I struggled with this question for years before meeting them again. Today, when I saw her, I knew the answer. But that was for another time. Tomorrow was just about reconnecting with my son and his mother. Back at the motel, I made a call. It was to a number given to me by my old friend, Pan. Pan and I became friends in prison when I helped him with a medical issue. The prison doctor learned about my background and I recommended the right treatment. It was a simple laser surgery to fix Pan's eye. Pan, who thought he was going blind, was thankful and promised to help me someday. On the phone, I said who I was and who gave me the number. The man on the other end simply said, Whatever you need, it's done. I told him I needed help with Hugo Bentz, who had promised to sue me. I offered to pay for the help, but the man said, No charge. Pan said to take care of you. As I said, it's done. Thanks. And please tell Pan I said hi. I'm still on probation, so I can't contact him. Will you do that? Consider it done, he replied, and hung up. Prison friends are different from other friends. They are friends for life, and they mean it. If they ask for help, you give it. No questions asked. I never heard from Hugo Bentz again. Hey, Rube, you going to your dad's this weekend? And what's happening with your mom and dad now? Anything new? Eddie was throwing a ball in the air and pretending to catch it. We were heading towards the park, hoping to join a game. Eddie was really good and wanted to play in the majors someday. I thought he had a chance. I don't know, Eddie. They've been spending a lot of time together. Dad came down last weekend, and he and Mom went out to dinner again. They do that a lot, maybe to get away from me. I don't mind. I like that they get along. Maybe they're getting together. What do you think? Eddie was joking, and I decided not to take him seriously. If I did, I'd have to hit him. Nah, they don't stay out late. They come home early and pick me up from Mrs. Evans' place. Sometimes we go out for ice cream before Dad goes back to his motel. Mom keeps asking him to stay, but he won't. I even said he could have my bed and I'd sleep on the floor, but he says it's better if he stays at the motel. I don't see why. When I visit him, I get my own room at his place. Yeah? What's his place like? Is it nice? I bet he has a huge place all to himself. I've only been there twice. It's pretty much a dump. It's in a bad part of town and the building is old. His stuff is okay and he has a big TV, but everything else is cheap and used. But it's fine with me to just be with him. We go to lots of places, and I go with him to his clinic. He's part owner, you know? Cool. Hey, come on. I see some guys ready to play. Let's get there before they pick teams. I followed Eddie to the park and decided to sit out the first game. Eddie shrugged and went to play center field. I sat on the bench and watched, thinking about Eddie's question. About my parents, asterisk, asterisk. I knew Mom wanted Dad to come home and stay with us, but I knew Dad wasn't ready. Even so, Mom was happier now that Dad was around even if it was only part-time. She dressed nicer, took better care of herself, and even did something new with her hair. It looked lighter and prettier, and I noticed that. Dad told me a few times that he wanted to be part of the family again. He wanted to spend more time with us. I thought that was a good sign. I asked him if he and Mom were going to get married again so we could all be together. He didn't answer right away, but he smiled before saying it was possible. 
I thought that was another good sign, but it might take more time. I just hoped it would happen. I was pretty sure things would work out. Suddenly, Eddie called me and told me to take first base. The kid playing first had to go home, so I grabbed my glove and took my place. I stopped thinking about my parents when the first ball came right to me. A year later, Eddie and I rode our bikes to the 7, 11 to get some Cokes. It was the last time we would be together, at least for a while. We had been best friends for seven years, and saying goodbye was hard. But we were guys, and guys didn't show feelings. I was 16 now, and Eddie was almost 17. He played varsity baseball and was popular with the girls. I was more of a nerd, liking the school paper and journalism classes. But we stayed best friends through grade school and high school. Did you ever think when your dad called you that this would happen? Did you really? Or was it just a wild dream? I looked at Eddie as he asked. I answered seriously. To be honest, Eddie, I didn't know what would happen when I called. I just wanted to see my father. That was all. I knew I had a father, and I wanted to see him. He had gone away when I was eight or nine, and I couldn't remember much about him. Mom said it was because he was an important doctor, and people needed him all the time. I knew I had to try to contact him after you showed me that story about him getting out of prison. After that, everything just happened the way it did. Well, were you surprised when your dad asked your mom to marry him again? Eddie was grinning. This was why we were here. Mom said yes, and we were moving to be with dad. He bought a nicer place with the money mom had saved for him, and that's where we were going. Mom and dad were getting married as soon as we moved. I was happier than I could ever remember. No, I wasn't surprised, but I'm glad she said yes. Hey, I'll call you as soon as we get there and I find out our phone number. Maybe you can visit soon. Count on it, buddy. We headed back to the moving van so my bike could be loaded. Eddie stopped as I gave the men my bike, and when I moved toward him, he jumped off his bike and let it fall. Before I knew what he was doing, he wrapped his long arms around me and squeezed hard. I was surprised, but I hugged him back and squeezed too. We held it for a few seconds, then Eddie let go, picked up his bike, and sped off. As he rode away, he waved once before bending over and pedaling hard. I watched him go, my eyes blurry. It had to be allergies making my eyes water. Sure it was. Hey, audience. If you like this video and want to keep up with more thrilling stories, make sure to subscribe to Prince Cheating Tales and hit the notification bell. You don't want to miss out on our upcoming adventures. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next wonderful story.